we're going to wrap up our week eight discussion of uh, this period in the early 19th century by talking about Anglo-American expansion west. And we'll be talking about the Lewis and Clark expedition. Many students are familiar with the Lewis Clark expedition, this kind of larger than life expedition that occurred between 1804 and 1806. But um, it is unique for many reasons. And I think that when this story is told uh, all too often, some of the critical um, um, actors in this set of events are uh, forgotten or are underemphasized, and so I would like to discuss uh, the Lewis and Clark expedition, and I'm going to take some time to talk about some periphery characters, specifically Sacagawea and York, because they played a critical role in the success of the Lewis and Clark journey. Now, when Thomas Jefferson became president in 1801, he hired his personal friend, Meriwether Lewis, to act as his secretary and to plan for Western exploration. So understand that Thomas Jefferson, when he stepped in, he understood that Anglo-Americans were going to be driving west. He, this process of settlement was already well underway. He, understand that he, uh, he seemed to understand that uh, Native Americans were, in his view, an impediment to Anglo-American expansion west, a kind of... Um, a challenge that Anglo-Americans were going to have to contend with as they drove west. I will tell you that Jefferson was no friend to Native Americans, um, and he felt that they were simply in the way, as so many uh, of uh, the Founding Fathers uh, shared a kind of similar type of view. Now, Jefferson, um, even before uh, the Louisiana Purchase took place, Jefferson actually wrote to the Spanish government who controlled the area west of the Mississippi River in 1801. So when he stepped into office in 1801 as president, he wrote this letter to the Spanish government and he asked for permission to explore the Missouri River and its many tributaries and he received permission from the Spanish colonial government to do so. Now, in 1803, Jefferson asked Congress for a secret appropriation of $2,500 to fund an expedition westward, and he was actually given approval by Congress. So understand that when the Lewis and Clark expedition was founded, uh, it was not public knowledge. It was not public information and would not become public information until after they had returned. For the expedition, Meriwether Lewis was selected to head the expedition west. He was 28 years old. He was from Virginia. That's Jefferson's home state. And Thomas Jefferson actually sent Meriwether Lewis to school in order to learn cartography or map making as well as a basic understanding of some of the sciences. Uh, so uh, from uh, the view of Thomas Jefferson, this was a fact-finding expedition, a scientific expedition, uh, in order to understand a, a pretty mysterious area to most Anglo-Americans at this time. Now, Meriwether Lewis selected William Clark, 32-year-old William Clark of Kentucky, to lead the trek across uncharted and potentially hostile territory. A crew of 50 rugged outdoorsmen were selected, including Native American interpreters and one slave, an African man named York, that belonged to William Clark. These were men who were very well suited to the outdoors, to the elements, and to exploration. Rugged, tough frontiersmen. Now, York, for his part, he was a very broad-shouldered, strapping man who became a sensation with many of the Native American tribes as they traveled west. Many of these Native American tribes had actually never seen uh, a dark-skinned African man. And when, uh, when he made contact with the Native Americans, uh, he was a bit disarming. Many of the Native Americans thought that York was wearing war paint and would actually step up to the man and would lick their fingers and attempt to wipe off his color, thinking it to be war paint. And so uh, York's appearance uh, often diffused potentially dangerous situations with hostile Native Americans. His appearance or his countenance disarmed uh, would-be hostiles, and he was really quite instrumental to the expedition's peaceful success. Thomas Jefferson's goals for the Lewis and Clark expedition were in part scientific. He wished to research Native American dialects, to collect flora and fauna, plant and animal specimens, uh, as uh, well as map the territory, specifically the Missouri River and its tributaries, and Jefferson hoped that they would find a navigable waterway all the way to the Pacific. They would not. In fact, the Rocky Mountains were in the way, but they could not have known this at that moment. Now, the Lewis and Clark expedition was officially called the Corps of Discovery. Uh, the expedition was a unit of the United States Army called the Corps of Discovery. It was established specifically for the Lewis and Clark expedition. And they left St. Louis in May of 1804. And along the way, they found entire Indian villages abandoned. 
with graves, the only evidence of smallpox and influenza epidemics that had virtually destroyed these communities. So understand that as Lewis and Clark and the expedition drove west down the various riverways and the, uh, the various watercraft, uh, they made contact with a lot of Native, Native American tribes, but they also found devastation. They recognized that European-introduced uh, diseases preceded them sometimes by many years. And so other European explorers who had uh, traveled in advance in the late 18th century uh, had often spread these illnesses and epidemics that wiped out entire communities. And so uh, this is one of the things that Lewis and Clark remarked upon in their various manuscripts and diaries that they came in contact with uh, these, just these devastated communities. Now, in the winter of 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition camped in North Dakota with a group of friendly Mandan Indians. And in the spring, they hired a French trapper by the name of Toussaint Charbonneau as a guide. Now, Charbonneau's wife was a 16-year-old girl, or probably a 16-year-old girl, by the name of Sacagawea, who carried with her a newborn baby. Years before this... Sacagawea had been abducted by a group of Hadatsa Indians and had been taken to their tribal lands in North Dakota. She was later sold by those Hadatsa Indians to Toussaint Charbonneau, who took her as his wife. So this was not uncommon. French trappers and traders uh, cultivated relationships with Native Americans, often married Native American women, married into uh, noble Indian families. And so Charbonneau, in acquiring uh, Sacagawea, he was essentially purchasing a slave who he then uh, made his wife, and uh, she bore him a child. So she was, uh, had this newborn child in her arms, and um, Charbonneau essentially convinced Lewis and Clark that uh, their success depended upon his guidance. Now, Lewis and Clark complained that the girl and child were going to slow them down, but she seemed pretty fit for travel. They actually nicknamed Sacagawea Janie, particularly because they simply could not pronounce the name Sacagawea. And as the expedition pushed westward, they encountered many uh, Native American tribes, including potentially hostile tribes. And as it turns out, not Toussaint Charbonneau, but Sacagawea's presence was absolutely critical in establishing friendly relations because she spoke the languages. Her skills as an interpreter were invaluable along the way. It was quite clear that she had been abducted years before from this westerly area that they were traveling through. And so she understood the Native American dialects. And I will also tell you that simply her presence at the head of the expedition as a young woman with child was disarming to potentially uh, violent Native Americans. When they saw these men, um, although they had cannons, although they had firearms, uh, they tried to use... Um, peaceable uh, means in order to make contact with Native Americans. And the fact was they had a, a group of just about 50 white men. They were no match for some of these large Native American tribes that numbered 500, 600 strong. And so they had to use diplomacy and tact in order to make contact with Indians. And her presence was critical to their success. So the expedition drove west. They charted the west. The expedition actually met up with a group of Chinook Indians in October of 1805 as they neared the mouth of the Columbia River. That's present-day Washington State. They um, compiled uh, lists. Um, the expedition notes gifts that were given to them by the natives they encountered. You can actually make out some of the things that they were being provided by Native Americans. Uh, Lewis and Clark even brought back two grizzly bear cubs, which they presented to President Thomas Jefferson as, as a gift. And he actually kept these bears in a pit on the White House lawn for a period of time. The Lewis and Clark expedition encountered a Shoshone chief who ended up being Sacagawea's long-lost brother. And it seems pretty clear here that Sacagawea purposefully led them, them uh, to her family and that this reunion was premeditated on her part. But the connection with the Shoshone proved to be really fortuitous to the Lewis and Clark expedition because Sacagawea's brother was the Shoshone chief and he favored Lewis and Clark for returning his sister to her home. He gave them supplies and horses and Indian guides for the remainder of their journey. The expedition made it to the mouth of the Columbia River in Oregon in November 1805. Uh, they wintered there, and then it took essentially another year for the expedition to return to St. Louis, uh, following roughly the same route, although they did split up for a period of time to see if they could find a more navigable, navigable waterway 
uh, and they were not successful in that particular endeavor. But the Lewis and Clark expedition, the core of discovery, was incredibly successful using peaceable means, using diplomacy. The expedition gathered an abundance of information and scientific data. They charted and mapped the West. They learned about Native American groups along the way. And they used diplomacy rather than force to get what they needed. We should talk a little bit about the legacy of Sacagawea and York. Sacagawea uh, died of an illness in the Dakotas when she was just 26 years old. Her son, the newborn, uh, was named Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau. He was uh, nicknamed Pompey by Lewis and Clark, and they actually took the child under their wing. It was actually uh, William Clark who took Pompey, or Jean-Baptiste Charbonneau, and made sure that the child got a Western education. Jean-Baptiste later spent time in Germany. He became fluent in that language, and he became an interpreter for trading expeditions to the West. Uh, he was actually fluent in Shoshone, French, Spanish, German, and English. Really a remarkable individual. So uh, Sacagawea, she succumbed to one of those European-introduced illnesses, as so many Native Americans tragically did. Uh, but her son, uh, the offspring of a white man and a Native American woman, had the uh, biological defense to withstand some of these illnesses. As for York... His legacy is an interesting one. York carried a gun during the expedition. Now, let's be very clear. York was um, an involuntary participant in the Lewis and Clark expedition. He was brought along as muscle. He was the grunt laborer. It was his job to push cannons through the mud, right? Probably not very much fun for York. But at the same time, we should also recognize that York played a major role. He was a major contributor to the success of the expedition. He carried a gun. He proved to be great benefit. Uh, he was a kind of diplomat in some ways, and his life was exceptional. He was one of the few people, let alone African Americans, to see the early American frontier. But in the interest of full disclosure, he was later forced to return to the grueling and monotonous life of plantation work. But William Clark did eventually free him. York became a free man. He was emancipated. He married. Uh, he worked in the freighting business in Kentucky and Tennessee until he passed away from a cholera epidemic around 1832. Meriwether Lewis died in 1809, just a couple of years after the expedition, from a somewhat questionable suicide. Uh, there is a story there on its own that I won't go into, but you may research that if you would like. As for William Clark, not only did he uh, play a role in the uh, raising and success of Sacagawea's son, um, Jean-Baptiste, but Clark also became the governor of the Missouri Territory. In wrapping up our discussion of week eight, we should talk a little bit about Jefferson's legacy. Jefferson's closest friends had been John and Abigail Adams. Political intrigues during the two men's presidents had created a lot of hard feelings, and in fact, John Adams and Thomas Jefferson did not speak for years during the time of their presidency and afterwards. However, very late in the two men's lives, they reconciled by writing letters to one another, rekindling their friendship. So although they never saw each other again face to face, because Jefferson was in Virginia at Monticello, and uh, John Adams was at Braintree, Massachusetts, the two men... Uh, wrote a lot of correspondence to one another, and a lot of that correspondence has survived. And so we know a lot about what these two men felt about the revolution uh, many, many years later, kind of looking in the rearview mirror and uh, pondering what the new nation meant and what independence from England meant. It's quite clear that they were very proud of what they had accomplished. Thomas Jefferson and his friend John Adams remarkably died on exactly the same day, July 4th, 1826, Independence Day, exactly 50 years after the two men had fought for and gained American independence from England. That is remarkable. Jefferson, by all accounts, was a brilliant man, but like most people, he was conflicted about a great many things. He recognized that slavery was a great evil, and yet he could not bring himself to emancipate his slaves. He obviously cared for Sally Hemings, and yet he was not willing to free her. Thomas Jefferson perfectly encapsulated the coming fight over slavery when he said that slavery was like holding, quote, a wolf by the ear. We can neither hold him nor safely let him go. 
he recognized that slavery was to become america's most divisive issue.